All right, so Ben is out of town in a meeting this morning, so there's no team teaching this morning. You just got me. Going to have to deal with that now. All right, so lesson number five. We, um, this is the second lesson in, in a, a mini-series built within here just on the work of elders. And we said last time that you might categorize the work of elders in, in three ways, to lead, to feed, and protect the flock. And this lesson today is going to focus a little bit more on the first two, on lead and feed. And so leading, what does that look like? Well, it might depend on what exactly we're talking about and what's the circumstances, but there was this, this diagram that came up in my mind from some leadership classes in industry years ago. You know, you have, a, you have a depiction here of a boss up on top in the picture, you know, who cracks the whip and tells people what to do and screams at them and, and says, you got to do this and you got to do that. And, of course, that's a model that doesn't work real well, but has been done for a long time. And then you have the lower picture down here where the leader's in front, and he's helping do the work, and he's pulling along, and he's saying, come on, this way. There's a big difference in the two, Right. And I'll tell you, the second one works a whole lot better, seemingly no matter what circumstance you are in. But as we're talking about church leaders and, and elders, we, we are looking for someone. We're looking for those who are kind of out front, those who are leading the way. And that's the general idea of what leading is about. And so we need to discuss how that applies to the church and, and to the eldership. But then feeding. We can spend a little time on this, too. Feeding, what does that look like? And, uh, again, it might depend on what we are feeding. Um, the focus needs to be on that of the church and the sheep who need to be fed and nurtured spiritually. That will be our focus. And so in practical terms, then, what we're looking at in this lesson, what we want to discuss, is the role of shepherding. And that it has a whole lot to do with showing the way and helping to grow the sheep to maturity. That's our focus, and that's what we're looking at. So, we go into a little more um, depth and discussion now. If you're looking at your outline, you see how that's broke out here. We're talking about leading, and what does leading look like? We talk first about being an example. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We've read the passage before in the class, and as we said last week, I think, there are several passages that you know, touch on the idea of, or tell us something about uh, the eldership that we're reading over and over again, this one being one of them. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly, not for monetary gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away number of things to discuss in the past, is, but our focus really for this purpose is this idea of being an example to the flock. And so here's the question to you that I hope you thought about some. In what way are elders examples? I'd like to hear from you. What, what would you say? What, what have you observed? What, what, what do you see as a need? In what way are elders examples? What would you say? fruit of their lives, their family. Okay, good. Go with this some more. What else? What, what do we see? Sarah? The activities that they participate in, like when activities are going on among the brethren, they should be present. Okay. They can, and they should seek the good of the flock. Sure. Okay. See, seeing them in, involved, an example that way, being involved with things pertaining to the church. Glenn. How they interact with members of the congregation. Okay. Interaction. How, how, how do they interact? Uh, do they interact, you know, with, with the church? So. Stewardship. Stewardship. Sure. You know, uh, 
probably take that several several ways. Stewardship with regard to how does that pertain to the church? Um, individually, how do they act in, in stewardship in their lives? Okay, other things. Okay. They need to be able to help us answer that the question and have it perfect. Have, and have demonstrated that. Their, their example in, in being ready in, in mind and in scripture, being able to deal with, with issues. Alan and then. If you look at the list of qualifications for elders, that's almost a laundry list of how they are examples in the congregation. Exactly. Exactly. To have, to have demonstrated, to have been an example in those things. And, we, and we're getting real close to kind of working with and dealing with some of those. Tony? Uh, their conviction, faith, and fortitude. Okay. To, to see their conviction, to see their, their faith. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways that we, we see them as examples. Uh, making a visible impression. Well, the very idea that they have to make a visible impression or to be examples speaks to the idea that um, we know who they are. Uh, we, we see them acting in a way that would be described as one who's qualified to serve as an elder. Uh, we, we, we see them in front, so to speak, leading the way in, in these things. Um, that they become a pattern of, of good conduct, of what we all are trying to be, what we're all trying to attain to be. And so being an example, I think, also says of itself, something of a method of overseeing. You know, sometimes it's not a matter of elders always having to say, okay, we can't do this, we can't do this. No, 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 no we, we can't do that. But instead, demonstrating what needs to be done. And, and being able to say, you know, you know we, we need to go this way. That, that's being an example. And so we, we should be able to see and envision this kind of, of, of leadership, you know. Um, being an example may in fact prove to be the most powerful tool that they have on being able to influence the church. And so all of that says something about a man being visible, being involved, being known. And so when you think about these things, even when you think about going through a selection process of looking for men who are qualified to serve, if you don't know the man, he's probably not qualified. Because he's, he's, not, he's not the example that he needs to be to the church. You know, with that as well, there's a side point to that too. It may not be his fault. It may be your fault that you don't know him, that you are not involved, that you are not there. We need to think that through. And we'll discuss that some more as we go on. But just trying to work some of these thoughts through. Okay, there's a second point here in our outline. When looking at a man who might one day serve as a shepherd, what do we learn from observing his life? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. In verse 7. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who have the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Kind of four distinct points there. They all work together. But what do you see with that? When looking at a man who might one day serve as an elder, what does this passage tell us right here about his life? What, what might we observe? You tell me. A, a teacher? Faithful. What else? Reputation. He lived their faith. What does their family look like? What does their family look like? Are they as a family fully engaged? Okay, good. Good thoughts. What else do you see? Yeah, kind of work this through. Let's think this through a little bit. You know, the, the idea of one who rules is an idea of one who, who guides or oversees, one who is, is leading. It mentions something about knowledge of the word and in that, that who, who has spoken the word of God to you. 
You know, this is, this is another means of leadership. Someone who has demonstrated ability, knowledge of God's word, and ability to, to tell others about it. I, I, I do not presume from this that, that means every elder has to be a public speaker, that every elder is, is eloquent in speech. You know, that's not the only way or means of teaching. I don't want to take anything away from the idea of being apt to teach. A little more detail with this later on, perhaps. But a known ability and attribute of being able to speak the word of God and, and to, to teach and lead us that way. Um, whose faith is evident. I mean, we, we know someone's characteristic with regard to spirituality because their faith is, is right there. They live their faith, as, as was just said. We, we see these attributes. Their conduct is noticeable. Something that is seen and worthy of imitating. We're talking about one whose faith is demonstrated and whose faith that, that we might even see, I want to be like that. When the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It really wasn't about Paul. Paul wasn't trying to say, be like me. There were some attributes of Paul, at least early in his life, that we would not want to imitate. But the point of what he was saying is, inasmuch as I am like Christ, that I am living for Christ, imitate those things. It's the same idea, the same inflection that I see and I would understand you know, with this, this as well. So elders need to be of known reputation. Someone else said reputation. I thought that was right. Their, their reputation is something that is known to us. There are as well some negative examples. Okay, let's look at a couple of passages here. Uh, Acts chapter 30, or chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 30. You remember the text here where, where Paul is talking to the elders from Ephesus. And he has given them a charge, again, of what their work would be. Verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For this I know that after my departure, savage wolves will, be, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Here's a negative thought. He's saying even among you, even among the elders, there'll be some who rise up and draw people away. And so we've talked about all these, these positive attributes of men well qualified to serve. You know what? We're also looking for those that are not so well qualified to serve and, and seeing that. All right. Other thoughts, comments on, on these points? Yes. You have to be humble and approachable mm -hmm. and not overbearing. Mm -hmm. Not up. So the, the, the idea of being very approachable. You think about the attributes we've looked at today. If a man's not humble, if he's not, what if people are afraid to go talk to him? And what, what kind of influence he's going to be able to have? What, what opportunities will he have to sit down privately and, and talk with them and speak the word of God to them if people are afraid to talk to him? You know, so you just, you just kind of think that through some. What is it? Sarah? You know, when you think about the idea of looking for men prepared and ready to serve, also of itself puts some responsibility on us, understanding what that's supposed to look like, understanding what the role and the position is, what it entails. And uh, so that, that responsibility comes back to us, or even being in a position of being able to recognize, wait a minute, you know, something's been said that's not right, even from an elder, and being able to address that. Good thoughts. There's another hand. Yeah, really.
Well, uh, you know, it, the, the question being about a man's children after they leave the house and their faithfulness to the Lord. You know, good discussion. We're, we're going to deal with that in, in some more detail in, in another lesson here. But I would just make the point that, well, again, we're, we're looking at a man and his example, his ability to lead. And, and so all of this becomes some kind of a reflection on him. And so we're, we're considering all of these things. Let's look at, you know, leading by example. Elders lead by their presence. This has been mentioned some here already. One writer that I've kind of enjoyed some things he has said about shepherding um, has said that, uh, you know, shepherds need to smell like sheep. And at first in a reading, that was kind of a peculiar thought to me. It's like, you have been, been around sheep very much? They don't smell so good. I don't want to smell like sheep. But I understand his point is that you have to be close enough to the sheep to really know who they are for them to know who you are. And, and elders, if, if they are not close to the sheep, they have no relationship, well, then they have limited ability. They have limit, limited influence. When we've talked about shepherding in the physical sense in some earlier lessons, we see and we understand what it is for, for our physical shepherds to be among the flock, to be there, to nurture, and to care, to be close enough that they smell like sheep. And I think there's some similarities that way when we talk about godly shepherds in the church, that they have to be close enough to the church. Their presence means something. Their presence means something. Visibility before the church. The sheep need to hear the shepherd's voices. You know, their presence needs to be, be seen and felt. Um, we've looked at, in fact, we're going to go here again. Let's, let's go to uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We begin reading here at verse 3. It's Jesus who is speaking. And he is to declare that he is the good shepherd. In verse 3, he says, To him the doorkeeper opens. Um, talking about the sheep coming to the sheepfold. And when the, when the sheep come to the, the, to the sheepfold, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Then in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Everyone could have easily understood the, the, the physical uh, uh, story, the analogy of the sheep to the shepherd. And now Jesus is saying, my sheep hear my voice. And so we're just talking about the idea of the presence of the elders, that they know the sheep, that they are close to the sheep that they are in front of the sheep, and, and the sheep know who they are, even to the point that they recognize his voice. They are familiar with him. And so the question then, practically speaking, what does that look like to, today in our environment? What, what does that look like, the presence of the elders? What does that look like? You're not afraid, are you? It's, that wasn't a trick question. What, is that, what does that look like, Tim? I think a lot of it like we think about this morning, you know, seeing the elders when we're, you know, they're greeting us when we're coming in, knowing the names of our pastors and our children. And okay. The level of engagement, I think, you know, especially when we're here in this building, it's very important. But then it does extend beyond that. When you run into them at the grocery store, it's sure. Easy. Good. Very good. What else? Anything, anybody think they have to that? Jessica? Say it again. Okay. Okay. Discipline. As in, as in what they are doing or what we do? Okay. We, we know that they have to be close enough to us to know how to, to, to discipline or to correct, to teach us. You know, we want their presence in our uh, emphasis. We want their presence in our lives in such a way to lead us, even to correct us. Okay, Tom? You know, for there to be that 
trustworthiness of itself suggests that there is a closeness that's there. Just like the shepherd that can lead the sheep. They, they can call the sheep in the sheepfold and they come out when they hear his voice and they're willing to follow. Just like in some of our, our earlier a analogy, you know, the, the leader is the one who's pulling on the rope out in front saying, you know, this way, this, we got to go this way. You know, we, we need and we want that presence of our shepherds that we know and we see them leading in this way. Let's talk about another attribute, and that of um, a unity regarding to, to leading and the idea of unity among the elders. We have to think of the eldership very much as, as a team that has to function together and to function in a united way. Uh, back again to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, we read just a, a moment ago, but to, to touch that again, Acts 20 and verse 28, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The passage again sums up in such an incredible way the overall work of the eldership and what they have to do. And we notice in scriptures, and we've touched on this before, the idea of, of elders, always in the plural sense. We don't find in any instance in the New Testament there being a church pastor. In the denominations today, that's what's most common, that there is a pastor that leads the church. Not the case in the Lord's church. That's not the pattern that we see. That's not the example, but elders, plurality. We can see, perhaps, some good reasons for that, God's wisdom in that, you know, multiple minds working together and balancing each other out. But can we imagine that sometimes it might be hard working together? I mean, I'm just a little curious what your thoughts would even be about that. What is your vision about this? Do elders always agree on everything among themselves? You think? Probably not. You know, so how do you work through that? If you could envision yourself sitting in an elders meeting, how would you think that works out? Some have to, you have to be as good at listening as you are at talking. Okay, well, how do you envision that? Do, say, yeah, that oh, that can never happen. <laughs> Speaking from personal experience, I'm sure, and from somebody. Yeah. But uh, how do you work that out? Pray. Uh, pray. Okay, yeah. It, pray. For, praying to, for, for there to be unity on, on these things. How do we come to a resolve on these things? You know, elders having, having an eye on the end goal, understanding here's what we have to do and we have to accomplish. Sometimes there's different ways of getting to that point and being able to see and understand and agree that we may have to compromise on how we get to that, that end goal. Right. Well, having been there and been in situations of such nature, what it requires is for an elder to be an elder, to be a bishop one who is, that has the qualifications that we're talking about. So that when you're sitting down with another elder or elders, you're talking about something you may find some disagreement with, but you work on working it out by the very nature of who you are and what your qualifications are, your character, your personality. If, if I've always got to have my way and stamp my foot if I don't get my way, then Agreed. I can't imagine an eldership functioning well where there's not an ability to, to, to talk about and discuss things, even things that you disagree about, 
in a very mature spiritual way, trying to seek what is the best for the end result. How do we get to that goal? How do we do that? You know, there's a number of things about unity spoken about in, in Scripture. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 kind of comes to mind. And it, it, you recall the passage where the apostle to the Christians is, is reminding these Christians to walk worthy of your calling. You know, the, the idea being walk in such a way that that is fitting for who you are now. You know, you're Christians now, and so you have to walk that way. And the attitude that we would possess is with all lowliness and gentleness of mind, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. We can make broad application uh, with that uh, for us all. But in particular, maybe, as in our discussion, thinking about elders, how, how, can, they, how can they find and maintain unity? It's with this attitude. And that's what's been expressed. It has so much to do about the attitude that that one must have, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, endeavoring indicates that there's, there's work that has to happen to get us there. We have to work hard to be of one mind this way, you know, but the necessity of an eldership getting along, I, I can't imagine anything more important in that, that role. Okay, so these are all some aspects about leading, how we might see or perceive an eldership leading. Let's talk about another point, and that's the idea of feeding. And, you know, what does that look like? Shepherds feeding the sheep. You know, Jesus mentored some of his closest disciples for as much as three and a half years. Uh, ben talked about that a little bit Wednesday night in our apostles class. And he was with them uh, a great deal, almost constantly for the last two years, and he said some of the same things to them over and over again, repeated instructions to them as he was teaching them. We think about the Apostle Paul and the work that he did on his missionary journeys. He, he had different men traveling with him uh, each time. He had uh, other young men that he was teaching uh, and preaching, Timothy and Titus and others you know, such as that. That's all part of mentoring and, and feeding in such a way that these others could learn to do the work that needed to be done. Um, these are just some examples that, that come to my mind. You, you think about the relationships that the Apostle Paul had with a number of churches, churches that either he was a part of establishing or churches that he would just visit from time to time, that relationship of, of feeding them, teaching them, bringing them on in, in faith, correcting them when need be. I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, beginning at verse 11, we're going to spend the rest of our time right here in this passage. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Because I think this is a passage here that really helps to kind of, I, I think, uh, put in perspective the role of elders. And not just elders, but some others as well. But our focus, of course, in this study is that of, of elders. I want us to read it together. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles. This is speaking of Christ. That Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I want us to try to keep our focus primarily at the role of elders, because they're included in this right here, in the gifts that Christ gave the church. Apostles and prophets were for a period of time, those are no more. But we still find, we still find evangelists and pastors or elders and teachers. 
And to think about the work here, focusing on elders, the work of, of elders, what is their role? The story is in my mind the, about um, uh, a group of young men who all had, were aspiring to, to preach someday. They were in a class that an older preacher was teaching. They had been talking about a wide variety of things, but on this day, they were focused more on the, the eldership in the Lord's church and what that would be. And the older man, the older preacher said to them, he says, what is the role of elders? Pretty quick, one young man spoke up and he said, it is to do the work of the church. Several others chimed in saying, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's the role of elders, to do the work of the church. And when that all kind of, you know, died down a little bit, the old man said, no, you've missed it completely. That's not the job of the elders, to do the work of the church. You have to think about that for a minute, because we might be thinking, well, of course. I mean, elders are supposed to do the work of the church. No. No. The church is to do the work of the church. Then what is the role of elders it, in this text? What is the role of elders? Or, or in, in this case, you know, the evangelist pastors and teachers, what is, what is their role? Verse 12 gives our answer. Teaching. I mean, it, it's not the role of elders to go about doing the work of the church and everybody else. We just sit in the pew. It is the role of elders to be busy. Is is to be is to be busy equipping, perfecting the church to do the work of the church. Someone one time made a little diagram that I thought was kind of interesting like this. Take it for what it is, for what it's worth, you know. We're talking about elders, we're talking about preachers in a, in a study. And um, I find a lot of overlap in the work of preaching with that of elders. There are some distinct roles, let's understand, that elders are to oversee, to shepherd. Evangelists are to preach the word, to evangelize. <coughs> Even those things have some overlap. But there are some distinct roles there. But it's interesting that in this passage, in this text right here, do we see how much overlap there is. That both elders and preachers and teachers have responsibility to perfect the saints for the work of ministry. Ministry, sometimes when we read that, we think ministry, that's what, that's what ministers do. That's what preachers do. Well, ministry is really just a word that's, that means, as it's used here, service. It's the work of service. In this text, who is to do the work of service? The saints. Everybody. And it is the elders who have responsibility. In our focus today, it is the elders who have responsibility to bring the church to maturity so that the church can be busy about the work of service. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. One of the greatest focuses that we would see of the eldership is to help edify, to teach, to, to, to admonish even, to, to help grow the faith of the church so that the church can be busy about edifying itself in love. So the church can be busy. What if it was only the elders that were trying to edify or build up? And the rest of us are just sitting in the pew. I don't see much effectiveness there, do you? And in fact, if that's what the, if the elders are out busy trying to do all the building up and there's nothing else, no one else doing anything, that's not going to work long. It's not going to last very long. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to work, Sarah. It's, it's, not a, it, it's not a secret today that among many churches, many of the Lord's churches lack an eldership or have an eldership of two. 
you know, for a church even of some size. And when you look at the second string, so to speak, who are the next ones coming on? It's empty. There, there's nothing there. I, I know of churches where when something happens to that eldership, you know, one of the elders dies or whatever, there's no eldership left. There, there's, no, there's no one else to be appointed. Way too common. Sometimes it's for circumstances that you, you can't fix, you can't prevent. You know, uh, circumstances where people have moved away, men who could be qualified and be good elders, but for whatever reason have moved away. Sometimes you look at a church, as you go around different places and you visit, sometimes you look around a church and you can see a number of men seemingly of age and, and some maturity about them that you would think would be able to serve, but for one reason or another are not qualified. I've learned over time that often that's because there's been no preparation at all to try to teach, mentor, encourage younger men for the day that they might be able to serve. And I'm afraid that has a bigger reason why some churches don't have elderships or have very small elderships. I'm afraid that's a big reason. And, and it goes back to this right here. Perhaps it's because preachers have not been doing what they need to do, teaching and preaching about eldership and what needs to happen, and elders that are not busy about helping to perfect the saints, to help them mature, equip the church in such a way that that, that we encourage and edify and build up one another. The work of the church is just that. It is the work of the church. It's not the work of the elders. But the elders will help us to understand and to do the work of the church. That's what good elders will do. There could be those times where there's where there's you know, one leg is stronger, and that's that's why there's three legs in in that example. But it can't stay that way. That is the time and that is the opportunity to start working on and helping the other legs to carry their weight. And I think that's the idea of Ephesians chapter four. There's more to be said here in, the, in these other verses just about what it, what does it mean? What's it look like to help the church mature and to grow? But our, our time is, is gone. Our time is up today. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. We've been able to talk about these things. And I look forward to having my partner back next week. I kind of like this team teaching thing, and I think it's been working well. Lesson number six is in the hallway. Be sure to pick that up. And I, I really wish that you'd read through it. Write down some notes. Study this, you know, so you'll be best prepared for class. Thank you for being here. <laughs>